you know, I want to say that I really appreciate being here. And this today's message really kind of comes out of uh, comes out of the Bible, actually. <laughs> Trying to take some stuff. I try to take some stuff out of the Word of God to bring here. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are, who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And that's all I have today. I'm competing with Brian. <clears throat> no. So this message is about self-control. Self-control and temperance is an important, it's an important fruit of the Spirit. And we need to have that. How do we have the fruit of the Spirit? We be in Christ. He gives us this fruit. And you notice it doesn't say fruits of the Spirit, like we can pick and choose. Let's just take this one and this one and this one, you know. No, we should have this fruit of the Spirit within us. And self-control is an important one. I've taught on a few uh, of these different aspects of this, but uh, it seems to be this one here really hits home. It hits home for me. So today what we're going to look at is motivation in life. We're looking at motivation in life. What is our motivating factor? One, we're going to see that Paul was a servant of the Lord, and his life was given to the Lord. Now, why was that? It was to help people enter into eternity in Christ. Paul had a passion for people entering into eternity in Christ. Our motivation should be running for the prize, and we must run to win. We must run to win. No point in running if you're not running to win, okay? I was just wasting time. Our view of life or our biblical worldview, that's the third thing we're going to look at. What is our biblical worldview? How do we view life? What is our perspective? What are we seeing out of our eyeballs when it comes to life? You know, in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 23, it says, Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be a partaker of it with you. So Paul was a servant of the Lord, and his life was given to the Lord. Why? To help people enter into eternity, which we just said. Paul wanted to save souls. Now, Paul was not a coach. Well, I guess he was a coach, and he was an umpire. But he was also a participant. He participated in this game of life that we have. And he was real careful that he didn't want to fall. He didn't want to get deceived. He didn't want to step into sin. And he's warning the people not to as, as well. So Paul was a servant of the Lord, and it was given, he was given to the Lord to help people enter into Christ. Our motivation, number two, in running for the prize is that we must run to win. Paul often refers to runners to uh, boxers, to gladiators, chariot racers, and trophies. Over 12 different references in the New Testament of people that are affiliated in sports. Isn't that something? So this is such an excellent, it's an excellent example of something that we can relate to, and especially the Corinthians could relate to it. So, uh, but Paul was a participant in the race. <clears throat> to the Corinthians, sporting events were relatable. They were very relatable because they had the second biggest arena in the area. So everything that he said regarding sports, <clears throat> it went right to their brain. They could understand it. Oh, I can really identify with that. And that's really what Paul wanted to do, is he wanted to make an impression. He wanted to get them to understand. You know, the main thing in Olympic games is to win. And a loss is disappointing, isn't it? If you go, you're in the Olympics. I mean, we watch the Olympics this year. And they look pretty disappointed when they didn't make it, you know, whether they were swimmers or gymnasts or whatever. A loss is disappointing no matter what sport you choose. But we run the race to win the prize. Keeping the prize in mind, we really have to keep 
the prize in mind while we're running this race. You know, if you ride a motorcycle, you got to be very careful of what you focus on. Because if you focus on the wrong thing, miraculously, you'll steer right into that object that you focus on. One time when I was riding my motorcycle down 43rd Avenue, headed south, doing probably about 40 miles an hour, way down the road I could see something fluttering. And it looked like, it looked like uh, some sort of soft paper, you know? Well, by the time I hit it, I found that it was a bowling ball. A bowling ball had rolled off somebody's truck, and I hit that bowling ball on my Harley, and I endowed, slid about 30 feet down the road, and had a minor concussion. I had a helmet on, because my wife, she's very big on that kind of stuff, and I appreciate that. But I was afraid to call her, because uh, we had just had an argument about wearing helmets. I mean, it was really a, quite an argument. And this would prove her to be correct. So I called my daughter to come and get me in. <laughs> but you know, it really hits home about the things that we focus on and, and in life in Christ. As a Christian, we must focus on the right things. We've gotta be right on what we're focused on. In 1 Corinthians 9.25, it says, and everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain, they do it to obtain a perishable crown. So the athletes do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we an imperishable crown. So they're temperate in all things. To compete requires a temperate nature. This means self-control. Have you ever seen yourself out of control? Have you ever seen yourself just not being able to stop something or not being able to do something the way you know that you really should? <clears throat> the Roman athletes, believe it or not, they were required to train for 10 months before they could even participate in the Olympic Games. 10 months. An athlete must refuse the things that may be fine in themselves but will hinder the pursuit of his goal. Do you know who said that? Do you know what famous person said that? Rocky Balboa, which is really a fictional character. <laughs> so some writer thought of that, pretty good. The church in, the, in Corinth must refuse things that are fine in themselves, like meat sacrificed to idols. This is the church, they, they have to refuse these things. Because having them may hinder the pursuit of an important goal. Now, keeping this in mind, what kind of things can get in our way? What can get in our way in our pursuit of that goal of the prize? What is going to distract us? What may be a negative effect upon our spiritual goals? Relationships, maybe? Lust for things? Pride? Arrogance? Anything that gets in the way of walking and talking with the Lord daily. Anything that gets in the way is something we have to avoid. Now in verses 26 and 27 of 1 Corinthians 9, it says, Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight not as one who beats the air. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. So training for the Christians is devotion. Devotion. Getting in the word. Spending some time talking to the Lord. This is our training. Training is also knowing that no matter what happens to us in this life, the Lord loves us so much that he's never going to leave you nor forsake you. That's part of our training is just knowing that. Knowing the truth of the gospel brings about a certainty, doesn't it? If you know the truth, you're certain. Believing a lie removes certainty. Now, what is a lie? False doctrine. Refusing to fellowship. Being a victim of circumstances. 
blowing your witness, being entrenched in presumptuous sin and unrepentant sin. But living the Christian life with uncertainty is like beating the air. Can you imagine that? I think of a shadow boxer. He's just, you know, he's just got a shadow up there, but he's not pounding anybody. You know, he's just practicing his form. And we can do that as Christians. We can practice our form. But in reality, it needs to be there when we need it. To compete in this race to win the prize requires discipline. Paul is a perfect example, a perfect example of discipline. He was shipwrecked multiple times. He was stoned to the point of death. He was falsely accused. He was beaten. And yet he pressed on for the goal of the prize. And it's amazing to me, and a great example, as Paul says, like us, he is also subject to disqualification. That seems really amazing to me. He's just a man. Even the Apostle Paul knew that he needed to be careful. He needed to be careful, and he's warning the church. In 1 Corinthians 10, 11, it says, now all these things happened to them as examples. They were written for our admonition upon the ends of the ages to come. What's it referring to there? It's referring, if you went up to the top of that chapter, chapter 10, you would see the whole story of the children of Israel falling into sin. It's almost like they just couldn't wait for Moses to get up that mountain, you know, because, you know, it's said that people don't just fall into sin. They walk into sin. They kind of go into the water, and they just keep taking steps, sinking lower and lower and lower, and the next thing you know, they fall. And the next thing you know, they're going, wow, I don't know what happened. I just fell into that. It's not true. But that's what happened with the children of Israel. And so now he's saying these things are given to us for our own admonition, our instruction. Upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Now, what's the ends of the ages? The church age. We are at the ends of the ages right now. We are here. There's not a, there is more ages to come, but you know what? We're going to be in heaven. The Lord's coming to get us. So these things were written for us. For us. So we must learn from our past. What is our past? Let's take a walk down memory lane, and Moses headed up the mountain to hear the Lord's congregation. He wasted no time. Commencing an utter rebellion, sin, immorality, idol worship, and as a result, thousands died. Thousands died. Read the story. So we must look to the past to help us gain focus, and we can see the consequences of sin and rebellion, and we can focus on the truth of the gospel. We have to look. That's why we read the word. God wants to encourage us and admonish us and teach us. These are the kinds of things that can happen. Timothy said, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, and believed on in the world, receiving up in glory. Paul writes, they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. And it's amazing, folks, we're here. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12 and 13, it says, So you think you're standing firm. Be careful you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will provide a way of escape so that you can endure it. So in this context, the children of Israel stepped into idolatry and rebellion. This is what was in their heart. The Bible says where your heart is, or where your treasures are, that is where your heart is. This is what was in their heart, and this can happen to us if we don't fight to win. If we don't keep our eye on the prize. What is fighting to win for the believer? Fighting to win is fighting for the imperishable crown. I want that imperishable crown. The crown is focusing on that thing which brings glory to God. 
so that if you think this can happen to you, take care, take heed, this can happen to anyone. When we focus on the things that bring glory to God, we're going to be in good shape. We're not going to step off or step into sin when you're bringing glory to God. You know, that's one of the thoughts that was given to me when I was a young Christian because I was confused. What, am I serving the Lord now? Am I serving the Lord now? Am I serving the Lord now? And somebody pointed out, well, when you're doing something that doesn't bring glory to God, you're not serving the Lord. You're actually going backwards. And that helped me as a young believer that helped me to set my feet on solid ground. Just that little bit of knowledge there. The beautiful thing about the Lord is his goodness toward us, that he provides a way of escape. And this means that the road we travel, God is raising up and equipping us with the strength and the means to get away and to, he's giving us what is needed for the time. You know, as we grow, we have different needs, and the Lord knows this. The baby has needs. The teen has needs. And the grown-ups have needs, too, spiritually speaking. The means to escape depend on the need that we have at the time. It's not always the same. And the Lord's not going to transform you into some sort of a different element, like in Star Trek, in order to help you escape He's not going to take you out of this situation and put you in this situation so this situation will be okay. He's not, he doesn't work like that. God will provide a path based on your spiritual growth. And yes, you will always have opposition in your life in Christ. You will always be opposed. You will always have problems. But the Lord will lead you to a place where you're able to bear it. That's what's important to God. He's like, it's like if you're lifting weights, you know, and there's a spotter there. Hopefully the spotter's not lifting everything for you, you know, but there's that place where you just need a little bit of help. And that spotter's just kind of putting a little bit of effort under there. But, you know, we just expect that the Lord's just going to take us out of this situation and put us over here. He doesn't do that. I, I heard it put like this, that, if you were in the army or you were in Vietnam or, you know, and you know you're, gonna, you're getting ready to get attacked and you're getting the lay of the land, you might find a little path that's going to take you a little ways up. And there you might be strong enough and able enough to handle that, to handle what's coming next. And maybe God will have to provide another path to take you up, but that's what it's like. That's what it's like when we're, when we're trying to get through a situation. We have to look for that path that God has given us, go up so far, and keep crying out to him. Keep calling out to him. In 1 Corinthians 10, 14, he says, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. And this idolatry is anything that takes your mind off the Lord. Anything that puts you in a different place. With me, it could be guitars. It could be amplifiers. Now, you might look at these amps and go, man, those are the best amps I've ever seen. And I would appreciate it if you did think that. <laughs> because that'll keep me from going to Guitar Center and buying a new amp. But we all have things we wrestle with. We all have things. Now, what I did to solve my guitar problem is... I bought the best guitar known to man. And that way, whenever I go into a guitar shop, I'm going, don't like it. I don't like it. I have one better. But the fact of the matter is, anything can be that distraction for you. Anything can take that place. So what should motivate our self-control? In verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 9, it says, Now I do this for the gospel's sake. So Paul's motivation was for the sake of the gospel. Like Paul, we need to individually recognize the gift of life freely given to us by the Lord and not be ashamed to wear it, not be ashamed of that imprint that God has put upon our life for the sake of the gospel. 
That is why. And in verse 26 and 27, again, it says, Therefore I run thus not with uncertainty. I fight not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself, I myself should become disqualified. You know, the great passion, the great love of my life is to share the blessings that I have with Jesus Christ with others. But this only happens being convinced with certainty of the hope that lies within me. If I'm uncertain, I'm not going to want to share that with anybody. I'm too intimidated. I want to be sure, certain. I want to know. So as I seek the Lord and I begin to trust him with everything, my view of life, my perspective changes. I see things differently. I see things as they really are. My passions adjust themselves. They adjust their position. They become ordered. My passions become ordered. My passions for getting ahead. My passions for music. My passions for guitars. My passion for family. They're all still with me, yet I see the more important thing is to be totally surrendered to whatever God wants from me and for me. My passions become ordered, and my steps become ordered. The Lord doesn't want robots who act religious. We can see by the regard that Jesus gave to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Remember that? He didn't look upon their robes and all their flowing stuff and all their pomp and circumstance and give them some adoration and respect. No, I think he called them a few names. And you know, a robot is really controlled by the creator. But Paul said it best. He said, not that we have dominion or rule over your faith, but we are fellow workers of your joy. For by faith you stand. Here the apostle Paul is honestly saying, we don't want to control your activities. We just want to help you stand and have joy in your lives. So Paul writes in Thessalonians, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become so dear to us. So here what Paul is saying is, I want to give you more than a Bible study. I want to give you my life. Because you have come to mean so much to me. And this is the heart of this apostle. And this is the also, also the heart of God towards us. This is how God thinks about us. As we complain about our circumstances and count ourselves a victim of this world, remember the early church and throughout all the ages suffered endlessly from persecution and afflictions. Ahead of this is this suffering savior who took the brunt of all the sin for us, making a way for us to have peace in this life and promise and hope for the next one. Pray, pray, pray that God will open our eyes and our hearts to feel the same for those who are without hope. And there's a whole bunch of people without hope. I want... We want to embody, to reflect, or display the gospel that anyone who looks into my heart, into your heart, they will see the beauty and the glory of the gospel. That's, that's pursuing the prize. The Bible says that when the people saw Peter and John, they marveled that they were uneducated and untrained, and they realized they had been with Jesus. And then, the, then they said, the apostle said, but we cannot speak but the things which we have seen and heard. You know, in our pursuit of the Lord, that's what's going to happen. The things that we talk about, the things that we say, will be very clear to anybody that we are in Christ. Holy living is living in the superior pleasures of knowing, loving, and obeying God that produces an abundant, fruitful life. That's called intimacy with the Lord. That's what the Lord wants. 
Remember where your treasures are, that's where your heart is. He wants to be that treasure. Our goal, uh, Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. Do you want abundant life? You know I do. I want peace and I want abundant life. I don't really care about things. Things are going away. Like an old pastor used to say, it's all going to burn. But you know what? A heart that's filled with that, with that certainty and that trust in the Lord will have that peace that passes all understanding. So our goal in this life is to hear and see personally with our own eyes the width and the depth of the love of God towards me, towards you. And I want to share and I want to reflect the love of God and I want to be ready to reveal this hope in my heart. I don't need man to say, oh, that's so great. You do so well. Well, I appreciate it if you guys could say that. But I don't really need you to say that because that is the perishable prize. That's the prize that's going somewhere else, okay? I want to hear the Lord say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. The fruit of the Spirit is what I want in my life. I want this fruit. I want the Spirit of God to work through me. I want to rest in God, knowing that he is in control, and he, he, is, he is in control. I don't, I don't know what I wrote here, but that's what I want. <laughs> I want to learn what I wrote there. It's probably really good. But you know, there's a method for gaining temperance and self-control that I want to point out. And one method, it's out of verse 11, it's the word of God. These things happen to them as examples, warnings, admonitions on whom the culmination of the ages have come. One way we're going to fight this battle is through the word of God. And remember, when Jesus was tempted, what did he do? He gave a Bible study. He told Satan how the cow ate the cabbage, you might say. And it says in verse 11 of Matthew chapter 11, the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. The next way is in community. What we have here in church, this is community. It says in verse 12, therefore let him think he stands, take heed lest he fall. You know, if you think you don't need to go to church, if you think you don't need Christian friends around you, you could be in danger of falling. We need this community. We need what's going on here. In Hebrews 3, it says, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. And sin, my friend, is deceitful. It can kill you. And the next thing to experiencing the imperishable prize is the trouble that comes into our life. Everybody in this room has trouble. Everybody does. It says in verse 13, No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will make a way of escape that you may be bear it. You know, James, in chapter 1 of James, it says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete and lacking nothing. Let it happen. Let these problems come upon you. It'll be good for you. Under pressure, our life is forced and into the open, and it shows its true colors. Our life will show its true colors when we get under pressure. You should see me when I rise up and hit my head on a cabinet. That's when the true colors really come out. But we should avoid leaving prematurely. Don't cut it off too quickly. Allow the Lord to do his work. Let the trial do its work so you become mature and well-developed and not deficient in any way. 
1 Peter 1, it says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved, distressed by various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tested by fire, may be found to praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You know, when you look at the olive and you take a bite of that olive, it tastes terrible. It's not something you want to munch on. But when they take and they squeeze and they press this olive, this olive juice comes out. And it becomes something wonderful, but it's through pressure. It's through pressure. And we are much like the olive. It takes a certain amount of pressure to refine us, to define us, and to bring us to that place that we need to be. Don't run from it. Allow the Lord to do his work. A Christian that is squeezed is like the olive and should produce more God and more faith in our lives. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this message. I thank you for this group. Lord, we have spoken the word here in this congregation today. And I would ask, Lord, if there's anyone in here that doesn't know you, that they would they would come to you today, that they would ask you in their heart, into their heart. And Lord, I just pray for everybody in here that you will bring them together as you have, Lord. You've watched over them. You help them through terrible trials. And you just keep working in our lives. Go before us, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Now we're going to do one more song because Huck's not here. And um, <laughs> this song is out of, it's out of the uh, Psalm 61. You know, in this life, we need to cry out to the Lord. Jesus never did direct his people to other people to handle, his, to handle their problems. He handled them himself. And that's what he wants for you and me. And David knew that. He wrote the psalm, Psalm 61. Cry out to the Lord. That is where we will find help. That's where we will find hope. This is a nice little song. It's very calm, soothing. But you, we have the words up here. If you can, you can try and sing along. But we kind of like this song because we do a lot of crying. We do a lot of crying. So if you want to stand. Hear my cry. Hear my cry, oh Lord, hear my cry, oh Lord, I will cry, 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 listen to my prayer. I'm a ref. 
refugee. Lead me to the rock. As I cry, oh, to God. Lead me to the rock. Shelter of your way, Selah. When my heart is overwhelmed, please lead me to the rock. When my heart is overwhelmed. The rock is higher than I to the rock that is higher than I lead me to the rock God bless you guys and everybody spend this next week crying out to the Lord. Thank you. Thank you.